Welcome to the Aircon Vault, recordings of the live streams from Airwiggle's audio conference. These are made free thanks to our sponsors, a sound effect, game audio learning, Kilo Hearts, Audio Kinetic, Sound Cuts, Sugi, Boom Library, Sound Warriors, and Airwiggle's, the online home for audio people. So welcome to uh, Sounds for Learning, Game Audio and Education, where I'm going to talk about exactly that. Uh, I'll do quite a little bit of, little bit of kind of background on me. Um, when we get to the fact that you can download the slides, you'll see that the bio is slightly longer than this, but I just like instead of having lots of text. Uh, so essentially, uh, my name is Johan England. Uh, I'm from Sweden originally. I spent most of the 90s in Stockholm making music. And then I ended up in, in London. And I've worked for many years as a sound designer, or sorry, sound engineer or audio designer in London. Um, and then in 2005 or something like that, I got involved in education and then I kind of uh, worked in a dual form where I did education a little bit and then sound freelancing, sound engineering for, for until around 2016 or something like that. And then I kind of started to focus more, more on education. And actually I had a few years before that also where I worked, uh, worked two and a half years, I think, in full-time in education, and then I came out of that. And then I got into game audio uh, by chance. There was one of the lectures who was supposed to do the module and couldn't, so I took over. And then I learned things like f modern and, and Weiss. And, uh, so I'm teaching a module on that, and now I'm in Edinburgh College, and here in Edinburgh College I'm teaching. Uh, we start out with game audio, and then we move into interactive audio, so more broadly how sound can be used in in other situations uh, than game audio, so for instance, for smart homes and, of course, for cars and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, so that's kind of me. Um, and please feel free to ask questions during the talk because uh, what I want to chat about is some ideas how I think we can push how we deliver education and how we talk about education in game audio and in sound more broadly. Uh, so this is not prescriptive that you have to do this. I think it's just more kind of how we can push it into something. And there's some couple of, kind of, couple of things that I want to talk about, which I think is good practice. And I think that if you're a student, for instance, if you go to education, I think that these are the things that you should probably make sure that you have access to and, and, and you can see clearly in your uh, in your education um but again um there's going to be some some things here so if you have questions please please ask me some questions cool so i gonna divide this talk a little bit about starting with the current landscape and what the current landscape looks like and then i'm going to move into essentially the ideas i have of how we can essentially meet the industry and I sh I probably I was thinking about this before I before I started it. I should have done like here are the things that here are the learning outcomes that we're doing. But I also think that I, one of the things that when you do a lecture, uh, it can also be quite nice to maybe not stipulate so much and have a little bit of a journey as you're going through the lecture. Um, but one of the things that I will talk about is definitely that things should be clear and visual uh, in education. So been a bit of a you know this is this is i couldn't improve my work here by not telling you exactly what's going to happen but you know so essentially i'd like to talk a little bit about uh the current landscape of academia and universities and higher education and the industry and i'm going to kind of stick this as a as a broad kind of example of how it works in the uk but be aware that this is kind of how it works in, in, in most countries, that there is a broad governing body, which is uh, essentially the government usually. And then they've set out policies around how we deliver education. And then there are uh, essentially the governing bodies. And in the UK, this is the Office for Students. I'm in Scotland now. So the Office for Students is has a, has a sister body here. Uh, but I'm just going to talk about this in terms of in terms of how it kind of works to give you an idea of what we need to think about on the university side and the education side, and then again, I'm going to talk a little bit about how what the industry often might be expecting and hoping for 
And in general, I think that uh, there is these two things usually kind of come together quite well. Uh, so essentially, when we have when we design a course of some sort, uh, be it for instance game audio or whatever it might be, these are derived from this kind of upper foundation where essentially we have something called in the UK we have something called national benchmark statements, and these are the outcomes for a specific trade or a specific profession or a specific so field or something. Um, and they tend to be quite broad and we take those and we kind of whittle them down to what becomes a course. And I, one of the things why this is the case, and as I said, this is tends to be the case in, in most countries. The reason why it's like this is because if I go to a university in Nottingham, for instance, and I go, and I become an undergraduate, for instance, and as an undergraduate in sound design, uh, then my course should have parity and it should be worth the same as if I do a course in London or in Brighton. And actually, more broadly, it should be the same, have the same value when I come out, uh, when I graduate, or if I if I leave it the first year or second year, as if I do the similar course in Berlin or Stockholm or wherever it might be. So the Office for Student, and I'm going to keep this to England, but you can just kind of think about this in, in any country. So in England, the Office for Students is kind of the governing body to make sure that the university courses uh, adhere to this and that the quality of how we deliver something uh, fits into this. So why am I talking about this then? And the reason why I'm talking about this is because when we think about delivering a course, I cannot just say that uh, we are just going to be doing F mod for the entire three years uh, because then that would not have parity. So some of the things that the essentially the ethos of undergraduate or higher education will include is to uh, broadening your mind and thinking about, you know, critical thinking. And so one of the things that we have to ensure within higher education is that we have things like research and we have things like, you know, referencing and all that kind of stuff. And for anyone of you who have done academic studies, then you're familiar with the idea of referencing. So essentially, and again, it comes back to this thing that I was saying that if you're a student, you go to Nottingham and you go to that course and you come out from that, you will have, you will have, have, have had have had have had the same requirements to do this as the student somewhere else. Um, so this is something that is, I think, in a sense, both both good and bad, like most th most things in life. So I think it's very good because it ensures that when we think about education, it doesn't become too f pointy on one particular thing. And we're allowing students to develop in their journey. So you come in, and you often do a variety of things of your undergraduate. So you don't just do sound design. You also do sound design. You might be doing some got modular mastering. You might have a module on recording. You might have a module on uh, some research and some more cultural aspect. And as you go through your undergraduate, uh, you get to the third year. You, when you do your final project in the third year, which is what well, usually what happens, is you have a, you have a final project in the third year, and then you have some ideas because all these different modules have given you some ideas and then you can go, okay, so cool. I'm going to do my major project. I'm going to record my band, for instance, or I'm going to create video to do uh, sound to this video or might even create a small game level or something like that. Um, and then the reason also why we do this is because when you come out of this, you now have a number of what's usually referred to as transferable skills. They're sometimes called meta skills. But basically, you have a range of skills, which means that you can now make some choices. So if you go into the industry, you now, for instance, know how to do some research. You might be knowing some collaborations, so you know that bit. Uh, but also, if you decide to continue in the academic sphere, then you might do a postgrad in something more specific, like, for instance, sound design. And then after that, you might go on to do a PhD. Um, and then, so it's kind of the way that you can think about it is that you would come into this funnel and it's quite broadly in the beginning, it's quite broad, different things. And then as we're going through this, we become more and more kind of specialized on what it is that we want to try and achieve on the other side. Cool. So that's on the academic side. 
So this is, again, uh, how the regulatory framework looks. So the Office for Student uh, is for England and the Scottish Funding Council is for Scotland, for instance. And we have on the left-hand side, you can see there's something called conditions. So this is what the Office of Student sets out. And again, this is going to be slightly different between different, different kind of countries, and, but broadly it is the same. And there are also ways of making sure that, for instance, a student who comes from Italy or want to go and study in Stockholm can transfer their credits or their, their achievements across. So let's talk a little bit about industry expectation and wishes. Um, so this is obviously what we're trying to do in education. So we have two paths, and these paths has broadly developed during, I would you know, I'd say, 20, the past 25 years or 30 years. Before that, it was much more about the academic journey, and now we have the academic journey alongside a more vocational industry side, and especially if we do creative creative industries, so sound design or game audio or something like that, there is definitely a vocational aspect where we're thinking about coming out from university in, the, in, the, in your third year, for instance, and then you move over and you work, go work for a company. Uh, although I think it's worth to say also that uh, nowadays is, is quite common for a lot of people who work in game audio and that to have done a master's also, uh, and then sometimes also a PhD. So, but so industry expectations are obviously slightly different because in an industry there is maybe less concern about um, how a student have gotten to this point because the student the industry comes in and they go like here's a bunch of great uh, undergraduates they've been doing sound design they've been doing game audio so we will we would ideally want them to have done what it is that we're looking for and quite often I feel that this is. It's quite in, it's a, it's kind of a quite a good uh, uh, overlap here. So I think often when I speak to industry people, um, there's often a, a, a feeling that undergraduate education meets a lot of the things that is needed in the industry. So a sense of maturity, a sense of being able to collaborate with something, is, and a sense of an ability to research on your own and to work autonomously. And often a, a lot of that comes from your third year uh, final project. So you've taken maybe a semester or something like that to put together your final project. And that journey, that last bit, has allowed you to kind of build the ability to work on your own and take you know, credit and take responsibility and, and, and ownership of your project. But of course, industry also often feel that there are things lacking. And uh, sometimes I come across industry people who say that, oh, we want, uh, we want undergraduates to come out and they should be very good at particular software, for instance, be it Pro Tools or whatever it is. And, and, but I think in my experience, and this is obviously going to be different between a lot of people, often it's not so much about that. Often it is this sense of it's great. But uh, there is a lack of understanding of how to work in a bigger team and being able to understand in the, the where you are, in the cog that you are in this bigger team and how this is going to fit into to the greater goal and the greater journey. And I think that this is something that we in education can meet better. And I think that if there is a crux uh, the talk that I'm doing today, then it is probably this. So I'm kind of going to jump into this. Um, so before I jump into the educational bit, I want to talk a little bit about something that I think that we in education can do better in order to meet this. And one of the things is to do student panels and master classes early in the year. Often when I see uh, master classes in university and stuff like that, they happen towards at the end of the year. And this is often because of practical reasons, uh, because there's lots of things that are happening early in the year. Staff is often busy. We're trying to make sure that the course is running like it should. But I think that we're missing a trick here because I think often when you come in as a student, it would be good for you to have an understanding of the different goals and aims that you could have across your education, maybe drilling down to the first year and then across the second year and the third year and so on. And I think also student panels is something that I'd like to see more at and we're trying to do something at Edinburgh College we're trying to do uh, much more of. And when I say student panels, it is essentially when 
alumni or comes in, so student alumni come in and they talk about their journey from having graduated. So maybe their past two years, but this can also be students who have done work maybe after the first year or the second year and they've gone work for some creative industry and then come back and share their experience of this. And I think one of the things I went to the Game Audio Symposium over the weekend in Leeds and there was a sound designer from PlayStation, a guy called uh, Josu Tolden. And essentially he talked a little bit about, his talk about was, was about some other stuff. But one of the things that he talked about, which I thought was quite cool was the fact that he described his journey and his, quite maybe a long journey depending on if you're starting out from my point of view quite a short journey so he was talking about he started out as a junior sound designer and over the five past five year he went from junior sound designer to senior sound designer and i think this is what we should think about when we do essentially master classes early on in the year uh, to give students an understanding of where they can go because i think it's much easier to identify with a guy like Jusso because it is five years is not a huge amount of time and you see someone that you can identify with someone he is is uh, not necessarily always that it has to be your same age but in the same type of place in your career so it makes it easier to maybe go okay so I can see what what this person has done to take these steps because if we step back from this I think that one of the things that we need to be quite honest about is that the creative industries be it sound design or game audio or whatever it is tends to very often be based around the network that you were able to build and the people that you meet and of course you can apply for jobs um, but it is often a bit of a journey to get that point so to see someone who has made a journey which you're not the person is not too far into that journey can be a way to kind of identify to that. Uh, I think we should definitely have creative masterclasses also, but I think creative masterclasses is something that we can focus more on later on in the year. And I think also it's really important to have those masterclasses when someone comes in. So if you have a senior sound designer from a huge game and come in and talk about it's amazing stuff, that is great because it can be really inspirational. But I also think that that should be there as an inspiration and we should think about these as two maybe two slightly different things uh, i also think that we should have talent acquisition of a creative uh, early on and what i mean about this is basically hr so game audio companies come in with the hr team and go this is how a cv should look this is what we're looking for this is what this means in the cv because again i think that all of us have at some point sat down and tried to write the cv and, and understood a job description and what it's actually asking for. And I think that, you know, getting people from the relevant industry to come talk about what it is that they mean in the job description can be really, really useful when you're trying to understand how this works. And especially when you get to the point where you're trying to actually look for work. Um, also, as I said, prioritize recent graduates of industry veterans. Uh, nothing against industry veterans at all. Uh, okay, cool. So let's talk about the learning journey. So this is where I want to talk about essentially the the the, the meat of 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 this talk, and uh, uh, which is how can we meet the industry and how can we make the learning journey more efficient? Efficient, I think, is a good word here. Uh, so. The three bits that I think is important for us to achieve this is iterative assessment. So I'm going to go through this in a second. Uh, clear outcomes of learning. This is also something you want to talk about. And this is very much about visualizing uh, uh, what we're asking a student to do and what is asked from you as a student. And then schedule feedback and reflection. And this is might sound a, a bit like the same thing as the others, but well, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean about schedule because that's kind of the the, the, the point of that. Uh, so the following proposal that I will be talking about and the diagrams will be available via download after the talk. So as I said, I've written the proposal about this. Uh, so this talk is essentially contextualizing that, that paper. Uh, it's a very short paper, but so you can download afterwards if you want to go back and have a look at some of the things that I'm talking about. So I'm going to give you a link afterwards. So I'm going to start with iterative assessments. So this is my passion thing. I think that this is one of the things that is really missing from education. And we can really do this 
there is nothing stopping us from doing this at all. So let me just jump straight in and talk about what this is. Uh, so assessment brief. Here's a brief. I, you know, a brief will look like a brief, and brief can be good and brief can be bad, but I'm not going to go in too much about a brief. Imagine an interactive audio assessment where you're required to do some type of uh, sound design or, you know, level design or something like this. So the project will include X amount of sounds or you'll be asked to do something. So Assessment brief is is probably a topic on itself to make sure that they are clear. I think one of the things to remember when you look at an assessment brief is that it's actually quite difficult to write a brief that clarifies precisely in a way that everyone understands what it is that I'm asking for um, in the right way. So I, 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 in my experience is that Assessment brief is something that should probably be iterated on in itself to try and improve them and make sure that, that, the, that there's no unclarity in them. But imagine interactive audio assessment. So one of the things that we currently do, and for any of you who have uh, gone through an undergraduate or any type of education, you're probably familiar with the fact that you have learned something and then you've been asked to do something and then usually you have sat and hopefully you've been able to use the university's facilities and something like that but often you come home and you work on your own and then you get to the end of the semester sometimes of course some modules have more than one assessment but at any point you're submitting your assessment and then it's pretty much just like i have no idea what's going to happen now and then you kind of hopefully feel quite confident uh that you're gonna pass it and then you get your grade and then you get some feedback and then I am hoping always that feedback, the feedback is useful, but essentially you've been given a summative judgment of what you've done. And what we're hoping is that this judgment and this will be beneficial for you. And back in the day, this was easier to do because back in the day, most of the education was done, uh, around the idea of writing about something so you would read about a topic or you would think about a topic and then you would write about that topic so often feedback was could be translated between modules and actually one of the things that i'm that i'm talking about in my proposal is that the university of glasgow uh are have written quite a bit quite a bit about iterative, iterative assessments across the curriculum so essentially across all the modules in a course uh, which I think is good, but I want to do this within the module. So one of the things that I want to change is to, instead of having feedback at the end of it, once you've done something, I want to have continuous feedback as you go through the module. So it's pretty much exactly how it works in any type of creative industry where you are creating something. Uh, in the game audio, uh, we often talk about level one quality sales, or level two, level three, and level two, level one quality sound, as I say, destructive component is like you put in placeholder sound and you go, there's going to be a sound here and you have something. And, and But that those sounds are not going to be kept. So early on in the project, you have to be aware of as a designer that whatever you put in is likely going to be, be discarded and thrown away. Uh, the other bit is continuous feedback is that if you were working as a sound designer, even if you were working as a senior sound designer, you will have a lead designer or someone else who will give you some feedback on the work that you've done. And now, depending on what situation it is you're in, there can be more extensive feedback or smaller feedback, but it's rare that you are sitting just in your own capacity and you're working by yourself for weeks and weeks and weeks and then you're presenting something. So instead, you're constantly creating something. And of course, one of the things that I'm not talking about here is what's common in the game audio industry and also other uh, industries is the agile process where you have continuous team meetings and stuff like that, where you just look at, at things like this. Sorry, uh, my, my cold here is kind of you know, coming forward a little bit. Uh, also important that I think that we should have developmental feedback. So when we're in education, it cannot just be about, uh, yes, the sound is great, or, you know, it also needs to be how 
the steps that you can take to improve what you're doing. And also not just maybe improve the sound that you're creating. Of course, it can be useful if you're a student, if a lecturer or someone else is, is oh, you can use this tool, this is really cool, or you know, try some more saturation on it or something like that. But there should also be some more broadly things. So there'd be things like time management, for instance, and, and how you can think about where you can find resources and research and all that kind of stuff. So developmental feedback is really important. <laughs> Uh, so here is essentially an example of how this could look. Uh, and I'm doing a little bit of this mistake here that I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward a ton of text um, in a PowerPoint. But there is kind of no other way to do this. So I apologize that there is lots of text. But I'm not going to read out the text verbatim. So, But essentially, you can we can think about this is that we have a number of briefs. And one of the important things for any student who sees this is that they're aware of what the type, what the brief is asking for, but also how it is assessed and whether it's assessed or not, and whether it's a pass fail. So you kind of know this because I think, again, going back to this thing of level one quality sound, one of the things that we're not very good at doing in education is demonstrating to students that when you're working on something, especially when you work with the client, you might find yourself in a situation where the client is going, no, no, I don't like this. This is not what we're looking for. And you have to change tact and you have to go, okay, so how do I change this? And we have all done this. I have done this more times than I want to admit, but I'm going to admit it anyway. So it was earlier on in my career, but I would get some work and I would go to town on it and I would do all this work and I would spend so much time and making it, you know, sounding exactly how I thought that they would want it in the way that I wanted it. And I would come back and the client would go, no, no, this is not what we're looking for. We're thinking about something completely different. So I think we, it's really important for us in education to add this. Now it's education. So this should be not in a form that it becomes destructive to you as a person but it should be an element where you feel that oh wow like i did some work here and it's just going to be discarded it's just going to be thrown away so even though i really like that sound i like that clap on this thing was amazing or that punch sound was so cool uh there's the opportunity to be part of an experience where what you've done is essentially thrown away so I think that this is important. So I think that within my idea of having iterative assessment, there should be an aspect of this. That doesn't have to necessarily be an assessment. This could be also be done in, in, in other ways. Uh, part of this is also, as you can probably see from this, from this grid here, is that there is feedback. Uh, and this feedback can either be written or it can be verbal. Uh, and then also feedback Q&A, and I'll come back to this a little bit also, because I think one of the things that I experience is that students go, so I read your feedback, and I kind of I kind of got what, was, what you're talking about, what is bits of this, which I didn't really understand. And I think that this is really important, because normally what happens in education, and what has happened many, many times when I've taught modules, I teach the module, and then I do the marking, and I submit it, and then I have no way of seeing the student afterwards because now the student is doing another module and i may, might be working you know on something else so i don't have any chance to talk to the students uh again uh, at edinburgh college we try to do this already um but sometimes it's also not practically possible to do it afterwards because again as a student you might go on to do something else so i, I think we should bake this into uh the the way that we deliver the assessment and we think about the assessment that there is a feedback and there's also a component for any students to come ask what the feedback meant and what the feed forward meant. Uh, exactly. Great. That's why I feel that that's something we should, we should add into this. So when you come into the real world, it's always, there's nothing worse to having done some work and then someone says, no, but we're not going to use this. But I feel that we should have this in the educational establishment where we can guard it a bit more and we can not 
it's kind of soften it a little bit and we can manage it. So it's not like this devastating feeling to it. It's more of a learning experience that, oh, wow, it's there, there might be something where I do something and it's not going to be accepted. Uh, but yeah, I think we've all done it. So, uh, so I think I'm going to just jump forward a little bit on this one here and I go into the next bit. So when we think about this, so we have feedback as we go through and then continuous feedback leading forwards to the assessment. Oh, I'm just going to jump back quickly and just say something. One of the things that, oh, blah, 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 blah. I'll, well, we'll come back to this. So, uh, so as we're doing this, we should build the project and the portfolio throughout the semester. So after you're in the, in the class, and I think that this is something that I'm trying to do often is that if I'm in class and we're working on something and there is a topic around something, then I try to also explain how this fits into the project that the students are working on and how it might fit into the assessment. Because I also think that when we talk about modules and delivery, everything shouldn't be about the assessments. There are lots of things that we need to think about in a module on game audio, for instance, or sound design that is not directly related to what you do. And uh, some things are, but some things are more broadly, uh, especially when you start reading papers and, and thoughts from designers like Walter Murch and, and, uh, similar people like that, then it's much, so much about the conceptual and the thinking and the philosophy around things. So I think we should have that as an element also, but I think it's also important to then state that in the lesson and essentially the delivery of something that this is more something broadly we should think about and may or may not fit directly into the assessment. Uh, we should also state the outcome of the briefs. So if we are doing continuous feedback and continuous delivery, then every component of this should be clear to the student what the component is doing. Is it a summative or formative? And for those uh, who aren't aware of summative and formative, this is simply that the summative is a graded component. So it will give a grade and it will feed into a student's overall grade for that module and eventually then for the whole course while a formative is essentially non-graded. Uh, a pass-fail can be both summative and formative. Uh, and in my scenario, it can be both. So we talk about a discarded uh, um, element. Um, I think that if you're delivering this, you might think about something where you ask a student to deliver something and then you're just going to get rid of that. That might not be something that you great because this is something that i think a student should be allowed to fail a few times because again it's not just a question of doing something it's also a question of understanding this bit of of you know the the, the feeling of this so you might want to think about this as a formative but again this is something that you kind of when you when you do this practically you need to kind of think about it a little bit and, and see how it works and you know um but we should make it clear early on to any student that what these assessment, uh, what the outcomes, what we're expecting. And then, as I said, you schedule lessons for feedback, Q&A, and reflection. And this is something where I think that we should not do feedback and Q&A and reflection as tutorials only. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for tutorials, and I think tutorials are really, really useful. But I also think tutorials can be difficult sometimes to use effectively in a way because uh, often when they appear it can be difficult for a student maybe to know what to ask for so i think we should schedule this i think we should just take a lesson one of the lessons that we're doing and go today is reflection instead so we have done this over the past four weeks we have worked on this project let's just talk about and and hopefully at that point also we've done type, some type of essentially assessment component so we can talk about the outcome of this. Maybe there's some feedback. Maybe there's some, there's some verbal feedback that you received as a student or maybe even some written feedback. So you just basically break it down. I know questions around what that is and questions around the assessment and how this fit in and also just reflection. Like what is it that you've learned over the past four weeks? And I think, again, this is something that we're terrible, terrible at in education. Um, actually just asking the question to the student, what have you learned in the past four weeks? What have you learned in the, in the past two weeks? 
so I think that this is an important aspect that we need to schedule. Don't just say that this is something that happens outside of the lesson. Um, so I think that there's usually time within a module delivery, within the delivery of everything to do this. And of course, you know, there will be more or less, but I think that one or two of these lessons where you do this, I think is, is something that we should try and do because it gives you a moment to maybe just sit back and think about A, what it is that you've done, uh, think about maybe what other people have done also, but also, also what you have actually learned and what it is that you have achieved during this time. Sorry, I mean, my cold is getting to me. Um, so here are some brief example of this. So essentially you have this component is formative in class submission proposal. So you can have this early on. So you come in and go, okay, so give me a proposal in class of what it is that you're thinking of doing and essentially what your plan is and what could be included in this. And as you'll probably see, if you look at the proposal, this has been, I kind of, drawn this out a little bit this is a more kind of abbreviated version of this but uh again again this obviously depends on level so you can do it differently and from a level four uh so year one in an undergraduate i would maybe expect this to be quite hypothetical so it'd be i'm just gonna you know put some sounds into a game um and i'll do something like this and but of course, at, at year three, I expect this to probably be a bit more refined that they should probably have some ideas of how this should be achieved, essentially. But this could be a formative in class where we start to think about how this is going to, how this is going to work. And then, uh, in this example here, and as I said, I think it's important also to, 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 to remember what I'm saying here is not how you have to do this. It can be plenty of different ways to do this and this is just an example and i wanted to kind of outline uh how this could work not say that this is how it should work more how it could work so here's an assessment brief in part two you have a pass fail and this is where i'm talking about destructive ass uh, assets and you would ask students to go okay submit some placeholder sounds to this uh placeholder sounds to needs to indicate what it is that's happening in the game for instance opening door whatever it is but we are not going to keep this sense. Uh, this could be assessed. It could be assessed as essentially as, as, as a smaller part of the summative and the fact that you have achieved this, uh, for instance, or it could also be formative. Uh, in this example here, I've got assessment part three. This is a fully assessed, uh, component. So this will happen, uh, probably towards the later part of the semester where a student will put forward their project where it is at the moment and the assessor or the teacher will essentially give them a full feedback on where they are. Uh, and that means the subjective aspect of it, and but also I think more importantly, the developmental part of it. You have done this, uh, sounds great. You know, you've used really good resources here to kind of influence on how you are doing things. It's a shown evidence of external knowledge here and you can maybe do some comparing analysis or whatever it might be and here are the things that you can do and here what you can think about <coughs> not saying that you have to do this but here are the things that you some of the things that you can think about and how you can improve this to meet the outcome that we're asking for to meet the, the assessment outcome so let's say that this would maybe happening in week nine or something like that so if you have 15 weeks uh, 12 weeks of teaching or something like that. And then you have three weeks of, of autonomous working time. So essentially this could happen in week nine or week 10. And you get a lot of developmental feedback of some resources, what you can think about, uh, things that you can do to improve something. Maybe it can also be things like, you know, you need to organize this session better. You, need to, you can't just call everything audio one, audio two, audio three. It needs to be, it needs to be labeled better because chances are that the assessment will ask for this to be uh, labeled in a way so it's understood. So so that means that you can take this and this, for those of you who have done an undergraduate, the kind of feedback that I'm talking about here is something that you would probably then be familiar with, with the type of feedback that you get after you've done the sum summative. And for those of you who haven't done this, what I mean here is that you're getting quite a bit of feedback. Uh, I, I'm not a big proponent of writing thousands of words of feedback, but you're getting enough feedback so you know where you are and you know how you can improve and develop your project so you can meet the 
assessment outcome when you're submitting it a number of weeks later on. <coughs> oh, I apologize for, for coughing. I knew this was going to happen. Uh, so we then have an assessment part brief four. And this is a, a formative assessment. And this will probably happen in the last week or the week before the last week where essentially, and, and again, I would suggest that this is something that can happen in class in the sense that you as a student come in and there's no more learning, there's no more new information, but essentially you are presenting your work for your peers, for instance, and you're presenting your work and you get probably verbal feedback, uh, essentially getting some confirmation of, of that the steps that you've done uh have been achieved uh, and some, maybe some more information on how you then can potentially develop it further. Uh, just look at averages. So maybe some gotchas is that yes, you have labeled it, but the labeling format that you've used is, I can't understand it. So maybe try and find a way that to label it that uh, fits better. Uh, now you shouldn't be submitting MP3s. We can, we can compress afterwards or whatever it might be. So it's more, Kind of hoping that this is a this is a kind of a last bit to kind of just get some some last bit of of feedback. But this is often then the way that I think about it is that this feedback feeds into the feedback, the written feedback that you've already gotten. So chances are that you might also student have also written down. So you come in with the feedback. So this is the stuff that I've done. You know, have I achieved this? Have I done this? For instance, and then you are. Uh, Often the way that that semester works is that you will have then no more teaching. So you might have 12 weeks of teaching or 13 weeks of teaching, and then you have a number of weeks where you are working on your submission. Now, I know that some undergraduates do terms instead, so they do three three terms, so instead of semesters. But I think it's, you know, it's a question of just figuring out how you should deliver this. But so you then do your final submission, and in your final submission here, you will get an overall comment, but there will necessarily not be this, this, this normal feedback to summative assessment that we are kind of normally do and normally, but we often do. So it's more, okay, so here's a grade and a rubric allocation we'll talk about in a second. And then also the overall feedback on this. And the overall feedback can definitely include some, some, uh, some developmental feedback. So for instance, if you, if I as a teacher know that we have now done, done, for instance, game audio, and then you as a student are going to go in and you're going to do a bigger project, I can give some development feedback to you saying, for instance, referencing software or, or something. So you can, you can definitely have some development feedback. First, I think that that's always a, 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 a good thing to do. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about rubrics also because so, Iterative assessments. That's, that's, I think that this is how we should change education and try and do more of this. And I'm not saying that this isn't happening. This is happening. There's lots of courses who in, include this, but in my experience, it's not always explicit. It is often done by lecturers who are putting it in, but it's maybe not explicit from the institution that the, the work will be given feedback in this way. And I think that we should try and move into this form that you as a student come in knowing that you will get feedback, which will help you develop your work towards the summative assessment. And if anyone wonders, uh, I don't know why you would, but if anyone wonders, uh, there is nothing in the regulatory, in the regulation that stops any university institution from doing this. You can definitely do this. Um, so, the other thing that I want to talk about from the back of this is making things visual. So uh, rubrics is a good way of doing this. So we'll talk a little bit about rubrics. Um, and also, I think one of the things which is, is useful if we're going to follow this type of delivery is to indicate the grade or the outcome. So if it's a pass or a fail or to give an idea what the grade could be, what it's kind of, I think that's, as, this can also be useful. So here's an example of rubrics. So rubrics are used as a quick fire way to just showing you, for instance, you have achieved an 80 plus. This is amazing. This is the best thing ever. Uh, and here's some text around this. So you get an idea of this bit. So I have a criteria here, which is create sound assets that demonstrate level two quality. 
And that is exactly what you achieved. So we know where we are. And then also the feedback can feed back into this and, and, and talk more about, you know, how if you haven't achieved data plus, um, if you achieve uh, maybe uh, two two or two one, so so maybe sixty five or something like that, you get some developmental feedback. How you can take that uh, into a distinction, and sometimes that can be definitely about uh, the quality of what you submitted, but it can also just be things like that you haven't done the right amount of research, or you haven't contextualized the work. So, but getting some idea of how you can go from from the grade that you currently have it been assigned to a higher grade, uh, I think is really important. Uh, I think rubrics can also be used uh, when we don't use a grade banding scheme. So in this case, grade banding scheme is 39 and below, 49 to 40, 59 to 50, 69 to 60, but we can also use things that pass or fail. And I think that pass or fail can be really, really useful because we can ask students to do something easier, something smaller, and as I said, also going back to, to the destructive component and just basically, so we can have pass or fail. But again, I think it's really important to have a rubric here also. So I, me as a student, I can see it's not just feedback. So it's also like, okay, cool. So I, I, I didn't submit both components. That's why I felt, okay, cool. Here's the feedback and the feedback will hopefully tell me of how I can, how I can do this. And because, you know, maybe I just misunderstood it or maybe I just missed it. So, but I should, there should be a clarification so I can see at this. And I think for when uh, we're doing something which is summative where we have the whole grade, we're using the grade from zero to hundred. Again, that gives me an idea of where the grade is. So, and then the feedback will then feed back into this and tell me essentially how I can develop this thing. So I think a combination of text where we get a feedback, or feedback also I should say that I'm I'm a big proponent of using not just text. We can also use use an audio recording, but that type of a verbal or feedback is is paired up with something which is visually easy to see. Okay, I got a sixty six nine. There's literally a checkbox in that bit. Now let me go and check the feedback and what it is, the reason why that happened and how I can essentially improve this. Uh, so in my summative, I will move this up a grade or have the opportunity to move it up a, a grade. So clear our council learning, which is what we just talked a little bit of this, but I think clear our council learning is important. And this is, again, also something that I could do a talk about just this. Uh, but I've added in here because I think it kind of fits quite well. I hope it fits well into to the bits that I've been talking about. But this is about making it clear to any student when they come into the learning journey, so they do a module or they do a course, that what it is expected through them. And this can be as easy as you're coming into your first module, a classic thing in end education is you come into first, your first lesson in the module is the overview of the assessment brief and your teacher will chuck the assessment brief on the, on the, on the display and then talk about this and then that's it. And that could be good. We need to have some type of it, but I think that this should also be visual everywhere and it should be visual in the same way. Uh, and one of the things that we use in education is a VLE, which is simply known as a virtual learning environment. And for any of you who have done some type of, 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 of educational or undergraduate or something like that, you'll recognize things like Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard, whatever it might be. For those of you who haven't done education, uh, uh, essentially this is tends to be the online repository where we put, could be re lesson resources and often information. And I think that this is what I mean that we should acknowledge the fact that when you come into a lesson, this is all sorts of reason why you're missing why an assessment or the information and the overview of the assessment, because you might have something going on in your life outside, which is occupying your brain. Uh, it might be some message on your phone. You kind of just missed it, or you kind of just tied that day or whatever. So we need to make sure that assessment information and outcomes are always visible and ideally in the same way across all modules. So as you as a student, the first time you learn this, you come into level four, year one, uh, maybe even before, you know that, oh, what was the assessment? I, I know what it is. I can just go to the online 
uh, middle or whatever it is. And I can, it will always be in the beginning of that module. It will say there what it is the assessment is. And I never need to go and find it somewhere. I never need to go and ask someone about it. I can ask someone to clarify it. Absolutely. But I will always know that it's going to be there. It's going to be the same thing. So I think that this is something that, and again, I'm going to be very honest to say that universities tend to be good at this. So this is not something that I'm saying that, oh, we're not doing this. But I think that this is such an important component of what we're trying to do. If we're asking a student to do work across a whole module and we're doing this developmental feedback, as a student, I need to be aware of what it is that I'm asked to do across this time. And so I think it's really important that we make sure that this is always in the same place across all modules. And I think that this is an important thing also. It can't just be for the one particular module because then it's like, it's like walking into different restaurants every week. It's like, it's going to kind of be similar, but it's always going to be slightly different. So it should always be the same thing. Uh, the same thing with uh, lesson order on content. Uh, so I think that this is also something that the lessons order and the content and when i say content this could be down to in this lesson we will be looking at implementation in fmod for instance so it doesn't have to be all of the content but as a student when i come into this and i can't get i'm going to work on this project here's the assessment here's what we're trying to do uh here's a point where i'm going to get developmental feedback here is how these lessons will fit into this uh because that gives you a chance to kind of plan things. And sometimes when you when you work on a project, you know, planning things means that you're planning from the beginning. You go like, list, list, list. Amazing. But sometimes planning also means that you're coming back after three, four weeks and you go like, ooh, I need to catch up on this because I've been working on something else or, you know, I've been distracted by other things. And then you have a chance to go back and see, okay, so this is what's happened and this is, I can now do this. So this should also be the same. Uh, so me as a student, I can come back and I can understand all modules, the structure of all modules when I look at them online. And as I said, this is not me critiquing that this is not happening because this, that would be very unfair. This is very often happening. But I think like everything, we can become better at this. We can think about this and be more explicit to make sure that this is actually happening. Uh, because again, of course, also when you're, when you're trying to prepare for delivery or something, it's easy to forget stuff. It is easy to not have time to do stuff. So I think if we're thinking about this, the word is holistically. So we're thinking about this holistically. We should think, okay, so here are the pillars. Here are the things that I need to make sure that is in place. And as I said, to me, it's more about the order of things than necessarily that all of the content needs to be there because I think it's important that the first two lessons might have more kind of content. So, so I'm more understanding what's going to happen, but you know, week nine, that could just be some bullet points of what's, what we're going to talk about because sometimes you as a lecturer, you might add stuff uh, because you see how the classes are developed. And sometimes also just, you haven't had time, but if I step back, just because me as a lecturer, I haven't had time to fill everything, that's not really an excuse and that the students can't see what's going to happen. So I think that that even if it's just like a bullet point, week nine, we are going to talk about parameters in, in RTPCs or whatever it might be, uh, then that should be there. So week 10, we're going to talk about parameters, for instance. Cool. And as a student, I go like, this are probably going to be more information about that when I get to that point, but at this point... Cool. So I'm going to start kind of wrapping this up a little bit because I, you know, I've been talking for an hour. So I think that that's probably the limit of my ability. And, and I have to say, it's, it's, I'm very impressed that, that you're all hanging on, which, which is, is, uh, it's very, uh, very positive to me. And I, I, I thank you a lot for that. Uh, I'm just going to say about this mark out reading directly related to the lesson. I think this is also something that Again, this is often happening. This is often done very well, but we can become better. So what I mean about this is that if you are doing a lesson, the information that is available to you before that the lecture is given to you, it should be clarified which part is directly related to the lesson, which is just contextualization. And again, even, even, important also what comes after that. So if you have some further reading, you can go in the beginning. This is directly related to what we talked about. This here is more contextualization. So I think, again, it comes back to this. So you as a student can 
come into a lesson because again, we all know that we have lives. We do other stuff. There's all sorts of things, but I can come back and I go like, that's fine. I know that. So I missed week three. That's absolutely fine. I can come back because I know that it will point it out to me what bit it is that I need to look at to catch up for this lesson rather than you go in, there's like five books. Like, whew, I mean, that's, I'm not going to be able to write five books or read five books or definitely not write five books. So this is what I mean about this. Uh, again, we have talked about this already. Have scheduled lesson time for reaction and feedback. And this is also something that I don't, haven't seen so much of. And I think that I would encourage lecturers and, and, and students to, to, to ask for is to have scheduled lesson time that is reflection and feedback. So there's no more new information. There's nothing about multiband compression or multiband saturation or how amazing face plant is or anything like that. It's literally just sitting down and talking about what you have learned. Uh, and maybe feedback and reflect on it, which also means that you can reflect on faceplant being an amazing synthesizer. That could be part of it, but, but it's no more information on how to use faceplant. So that's what I mean. So I think this is important to have this as a scheduled bit and not just as tutorials outside of the lesson. So that, uh, dedicated software training. I've left this to the last bit. Uh, this is something that we are trialing at Edinburgh College. So we're going to do a first week of teaching. Is going to be teaching software only. So, and we are going to focus on Pro Tools because Pro Tools is what we're using across most of our modules. So the idea of this is to essentially that students can come in and they get an idea of how the software will be used. And if you have used Pro Tools before, great. Then you can get some ideas how to use it for lessons. If you've not used Pro Tools before, that means that you can learn how to use some of it. And that also means that the second week you come into lesson and the teacher is going, okay, cool. We are going to import a video to the Pro Tools because we are going to populate some of the, you know, the sounds in here or we're going to replace something. Then essentially the idea is that you as a student now have the skills to do this. So instead of having the teacher going, Today, I'm going to first show you how to do import a video and how to do some common key commands in Pro Tools. And then we're going to talk about how to essentially add a sound to or using, you know, uh, some of the functions for that. So we try and do this as a dedicated thing. So the learning is simply straight on software training. This is how Pro Tools works. Uh, we sadly don't have Reaper at uh, uh, Edinburgh College, which I'm actually... Uh, broadly okay with because because i think that software is something that we use as tools and we should never say that one tool is is more important than the other because it isn't um but i'm a fan of reaper so of course i would like to see reaper but we have able to live we have protos and we have logic so it'll be a week of that but the focus will be on protos and again i would encourage colleges and institutions to think about this is to take out the software training from the lessons because it's common to, to do this thing. You go in and, okay, so I'm going to talk about EQ. Let me first teach you how to do this in logic. And I'm kind of going like, well, I mean, that, then, then you're teaching logic. You're not teaching EQs. So I think that if we can take the software training and we can place that in the beginning of something, uh, you can also run parallel a little bit and say that this is how you do something. This is how you import video. This is how keyboard commands works in logic. This is how they work in MSLI, whatever it is. Uh, and then when you come into classroom, then ideally and hopefully all students will be able to do that part of it. And we can focus on the bit that is the learning, which is this is how compression works. This is how EQs works. This is how essentially implementation works. So, uh, which is true, actually, I, I, you know, talking about this and reading about this, I should need to need to figure out how to put Weiss and F mod into this also. But that's a, that's a later, that's a later problem. Cool. Uh, okay. So this should happen outside of lessons. It's actually, as I said, that's me. So thank you very much for persisting. Uh, hopefully this has been useful slides and papers. So if you do the classic QR thing, that should take you to, uh, the site. It's just my blog. So you can download it from there and you can have the slides and the slides will have, uh, broadly the same information. Uh, this is slightly different uh cool so i'm going to stop sharing come back here oh i believe that uh my camera has stopped cameraing my camera has stopped cameraing oh there we go we're back cool uh so apologies for quite a lot of information me talking at you um uh, so 
I'll invite you to have some questions now. Of course, you can also contact me afterwards. So if there's any questions in the chat, so please do that. Uh, cool, Sam. I'm glad that you liked the idea of using, you know, software training. I think that that can be really useful, but I also want to take it out of the classroom. Uh, Steve, I'd love to do some C sharp. Um, it is something that happens on the on the higher levels. Yes, sorry, Lewis. I've been I've been talking quite a bit. As I said, I'm obviously around Air Wiggles uh, quite a bit. So if you have any questions about this, the stuff that I brought up today, please feel free to reach out either on Airwinkles or, or LinkedIn or whatever, uh, and if there's anything that you feel. But I think also if there's anything that I would like you to take with you from this is that you should have a clarity in what you're being asked to do. And if you feel that your institution isn't doing this, you should go and tell them because it might just be a simple thing that they didn't realize that. They, they didn't look at the middle and realize that it was confusing what was going on. So I think sometimes it's just going like, be really good if we could have the assessment information in the beginning. So, no, I don't feel constrained by the curriculum. I, I you know, often, often I have the ability to create the curriculum by myself. But, it, but moving back to what I started talking about, I like just, <laughs> just go to this talk. We, what we're trying to do, or what education is trying to do, is make sure that the value of education, the value of your degree, should be the same across wherever you are in the country or countries. So I think there are some things that I need to think about when I do. I can't just teach F1. I also need to think about teaching some cultural aspects to it and some, some of course, like some, some more research aspect of it, which sometimes you go, I just want to learn F1. Uh, but it's also like, you know, I will ask the students, okay, if you are talking about F1, you need to cite the F1 forum that you went to. But I think that that's not, that's not a, a restriction. That's not a constraint. That is essentially always reminding me as a lecturer that it isn't just about one particular thing. Like Reaper, I'd love to talk about scripts about Reaper, but I wouldn't want to teach Reaper that way. I want to go into a classroom and go, okay, I'm going to teach Reaper. Here are all the resources and all the script that you need to learn to, you know, to use that. So this is something that you as a, as a student or a learner uh, should be given the tools to understand that, okay, there are other things that I need to add this and I can use this in this way and I can use it in that way. And so, so I don't think it's a constraint at all. Cool. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, do we preside, process specific in middle curriculum? You mentioned animal ecology and principles name talk, or do you use both ways? Uh, we, uh, I teach, I tend to teach using F1. Uh, just again, that there is, uh, there is very much, I've spoken to many, many educators and game people about this. Mice is without a doubt used in the triple A's and the double A's much, much more. Um, and, but again, it comes back to this thing is I don't think it should be about the software. I think it should be about the learning tools so you can do something. So, and in F mod, it's also, there's also actually just a really easy technical thing. F mod works much better on Macs than it does on PC. Uh, sorry, uh, F mod works much better than, than on Macs than Wise. Wise is just, uh, Max is just like, ah. So, because we use Max so often in education, uh, it's just easy to use FMOD. So, it's a little bit of a kind of just a, a cop out there. But f further on, uh, students tend to kind of look into WISE themselves. And then we do workshops around this also to kind of broaden that aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, this is, one thing that we should think about higher education it's 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 giving you the opportunity of new undergraduates to think about and learn about some other stuff and then as you're going through this the specialization happens because you leave college and then you go out and you become a sound designer at a, a game studio or something like that and you are churning out and you're learning puck force and all that kind of stuff and agile and whatever it might be you know it's, and it becomes very specialized in something or 
It can also be that the fact that you then do the specialization yourself by doing a master's and then a PhD. But in the beginning, it should. In the beginning, what I mean, to the first, at least the first two years, it should be an ability to come across quite a few different things. I don't think it needs to be everything under the sun, but quite a few different things. So you can kind of go like, I thought I was really into doing this stuff, but I can see that this this is really interesting. I, you know, I can take my skills here and I can do this thing. Uh, I think student buying is, is one of those things that all universities and all colleges should have a robust student buying by student voice and student forums and, and all that kind of stuff. I think one of the one of the aspects of this is that you can ask your students. You can talk to your students about this. It doesn't have to be like this is how we do stuff. Uh, you can explain. I find I find often if you explain what it is that you're trying to do and how it's going to fit into it, most people go, "Okay, yeah, no, I I can see how this works." And of course, you know, I don't think that as a lecturer you should also go in go in and here's my idea how we're going to do it. So I think that one of the things that I'm doing now is to also work with the rest of the faculty at Edinburgh College to talk about this so with my bosses and, and my, my colleagues on how to work with this. And then we will try out some of this and then we'll get some feedback from the students. So this is not something I, th I think that you can go like, okay, boom, we put it in and then it's going to be working in a year. No, we kind of, we put it in. So, and then I think in Edinburgh College, we will look at some of this, uh, with the idea that we're hoping if we we work with this and it becomes successful that in a couple of years time we will definitely on the third year we will have this as very much a part of how it works so we'll do it step by step and that way also we're making sure that we get student student voice uh student buy-in is 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 can be it's hard to get buy-in uh, so i think student voice is more feedback is, is what i'm looking for Cool. Okay. So I'm going to thank you very much. As I said, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions uh, about this or any thoughts, because this is a proposal. This is not me saying this is how you should do it. This is, uh, here's how I think that we could develop this to make it more uh, beneficial for not just for students, but for also for, for people who are working in the industry and, and hoping that students are coming out with the skills that the industry is looking for. So. Um, this is something that we should discuss and talk about and iterate around as, as much as possible. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys, and thanks for joining me. And enjoy the rest of the aircon. It's super cool. Thanks, Lewis and Greg and the whole Air Wiggles team for putting this together because it is pretty amazing stuff. And I'm really looking forward to, to some of the talks over the next few days. Uh, cool. Thank you. Take care now.